You can call me Peter, that's fine. <laughs> okay, good morning. Uh, I'm Eric Cook from McGill. Thank you uh, for attending and thank you to the organizers for uh, forming this uh, interesting discussion, the Summer School in Consciousness. Um, I'm going to give you, as most of the speakers do, they come up and give you somewhat of their theory or their grand view of consciousness. I don't have much of a grand view, but, uh, but I'll give you a bit of where I'm coming from. Um, I'm a neuroscientist, so although I don't know how to define consciousness and, and I don't really know how to study it, um, I do think I believe or know what the what the end goal is, what the form of the solution will take. It'll be a functional description based on mathematics and be very precise. And I think we all can agree on that. I think these linguistic arguments of, you know, is it this or that, help us get to this process, but they're, they're certainly not the end goal. And what I've learned from attending some of the earlier lectures is that a number of people are working on sort of the reverse. Uh, this You might think is what I do is reverse engineering. There's a number of investigators doing sort of real engineering, trying to generate artificial, quote, conscious thinking machines. And, uh, and there's a couple interesting questions. Uh, who's going to really solve first, and even though there's a lot of crosstalk between the two? Uh, I think the artificial guys are going to come out with the solution or interesting solutions before the neuroscientist. But I think our uh, descriptions are, are going to be more meaningful to humans. The other interesting question is, are these functional descriptions going to be similar? Are they unique? Or is there a class of descriptions? Uh, and I'm not talking about the neural implementation or the physical implementa implementation. I'm talking about just the functional des description. Or is there one? Is there many? That becomes sort of indistinguishable at this end. So, uh, and I say this because when I was your age, some of these students thinking about a career in research. I was an engineer and I was very much interested in doing this. And I thought this would be cool. Let's build some smart robots. A neuroscientist came along and whispered to me, said, you know, there, there's no smart machines. Uh, if you really want to study smart machines, you have to go to the biology. And I, I was an impressionable youth, and I said, okay, and, and that's what I did. Now, for the last 15 years, I've been looking back at these guys and their progress, and it's, I find this very interesting. And so this is, maybe I have robot envy, but this is sort of, I see a lot of progress here, and not so much here, but, but we'll see. Both of these are very hard problems. Okay, so uh, given that, my question today is sort of very well set up by, Wolf Singer's talk, Mike Shanlin before that, and, and many others. Uh, let's, you know, let's take a sort of a small, well-described question and let's run at it as best we can. So let's think about small fluctuations in neural activity and how they lead to conscious visual perception. And this will be a model of maybe of what this consciousness thing is all about. But I'm going to tell you right now, there is going to be no neural correlates of consciousness there may be a neural suggestion of consciousness at the very, very end, but you've got to hold out to the very end. Of course, everyone starts off with some version of this description, right? Sensory activity, action, something interesting in the middle. I don't know how to define it, so I just put a question mark. But this is what we want to know about, right? Okay. So I think we're all in agreement of, of this box is the interesting box. So our approach in my laboratory has been, uh, for quite a while, is to measure you know, sensory activity and how it bounces around and, and how the actions bounce around or the perceptions and use that to deduce or to infer however you want to think about it, what's in the middle. Now you're thinking, well, why don't you just go and study the middle? And uh, to me, the middle's a little scary. I don't know where it lives in the brain. I don't know where these neural correlates of consciousness are occurring. So I'm going to stick to something I do understand. I know how sensory signals evolve and what they mean. And so by observing these two ends, maybe we can figure out what's in the middle. And that'll be what I'm going to talk about. But I'm going to start you off at the bottom. Wolf Singer sort of did that as well with this idea of the brain 
is composed of neurons, and it's still a sort of debate uh, what exactly neurons compute. Um, uh, the neurons have a cell body, and they fire action potentials. We know that, and I'm going to show you a lot of neural recordings from action potentials. But they integrate a lot of synaptic input, and this is the part of the neuron that decodes the synaptic input. And what is the mechanism that decodes the synaptic input? The problem is we all know that this is a very nonlinear thing. Biophysics it gives us lots of details that we ignore. Uh, and uh, as Wolf Singer says, there's a lot of so nonlinearities that could be exploited to do interesting computations. And one reoccurring one is, uh, that was highlighted is if you poke a neuron that's sitting in a dish quietly all of a sudden, you may get some sort of linear predictable uh, effects, and then you maybe get some very nonlinear things like a dendritic spike. So these are current injections into a dendrite of a neuron, and you know, uh, okay, this, this could be some very interesting computation there, such as synchrony detection in dendrites. But most of these experiments have been done in neurons that are very quiet, that are sitting in dish, and that are removed from the brain. So uh, early on when I started my lab, I, I was thinking about these questions, and I wanted to get, uh, we were sort of, well, can we really measure what this input-out function of a neuron might be? And it, if you present a neuron with something you might think is more realistic input, not just a single poke, but you really drive it hard for seconds of variable stimulus mimicking this random background of these thousands of synapses that impinge on the dendrites, what you find is this dendrite to soma transformation is highly linear. In fact, this is the signal going into the dendrite with one electrode. These are patch clamp experiments. This is a cortical neuron, uh, data from a cortical neuron. The picture may be a data from a pyramidal neuron from the hippocampus. It doesn't matter, it's been in both areas. Uh, so here is the somatic membrane potential. There's action potentials that are being fired that we remove. But what I want to point out is there is a dashed line and a black line. One is the, the actual responses of the neuron, and the other is a model, a functional model, essentially a linear filter that has a, you know, a sort of a bandpass filter with a resonance around theta in the theta frequency range. This experiment's been duplicated two or three times now in different laboratories. The results are always the same. Uh, and, and so uh, the important point is you have a neuron that sort of is this linear integrator. Okay, so where did all the nonlinearities go? Well, maybe they're still sitting at the synapse, and then I haven't, we haven't studied the synapse yet, okay? And uh, we'll think that there's nonlinearities at the synapse, but the transfer function sure looks very linear, okay? We're accounting for 95% of the variance. What more do we need to do? Um, now, you're thinking at this point, this is, a, this is a consciousness workshop, summer school. What am I here showing you, you know, integration properties of single neurons? But I think there's a relationship. And this relationship can be uh, illustrated by another experiment we did in our lab. Where, as you tell, uh, if you bear with me, at the, at the, towards the end of the talk, these integration properties become important. And so early on, we wanted to understand as uh, how animals, monkey subjects, process motion stimuli. I'm going to talk a lot about models of motion processing. Um, and we were interested in how animals process or integrate very brief signals on the order of tens of milliseconds. And we did this in one particular experiment. It's easy to do by varying a, a pulse that the animal can barely detect. And, separating in time with a very weak pulse, subthreshold pulse, and from moving the, these back and forth, you can sort of recreate the animal's integration. And what we found is shown here, and I'm also showing the integration window in time of what we find in our neural uh, patch clamp cellular recordings, which are actually done by some colleagues that can actually do these experiments. These experiments are very difficult, the ones in single neurons. But the point is, and we didn't send out to do this, but these, these integration windows, so this is the time domain description of these integration windows of the neuron, and the dots are what the monkey was doing, uh, monkeys, as they detected this motion pulse. So we extracted this from behavior, and notice these things are very similar. Okay. So there is a relationship, and it brings up this interesting question I can't answer, but is the temporal capabilities of the brain at whole, as a whole limited by what the temporal capabilities of single neurons do? Uh, 
And so this, maybe it was just by lucky chance, suggested maybe these two things are related. We'll come back to this, these integration windows, towards the end of the presentation. But let's get back now, now that we started at the bottom, let's move back up sort of towards the top, is the main question uh, my lab has been thinking about over the last few years are uh, how fluctuations in activity in sensory areas of visual cortex are linked to perception of visual stimuli. We use motion, so we build upon the work by Mike Shallon, Bill Newsom, Tony Mofsham, Ken Britton, and, and, and all of those guys. Uh, that initially showed that this is sort of a useful technique for linking sensory activity to perception and understanding what this link is. And the real important notion here is that there's a sensory pool that we can identify that's activated when an animal observes a particular uh, uh, stimuli. In these classic experiments, of course, this was net uh, coherent motion. You should see drifting to the right. And what we know, the visual system is a great place to study this question because we know exactly where the sensory pool is in an area called MT of the visual cortex that is activated, that's carrying the directional information and the monkey's making a decision on which way the motion goes and you can record uh, neural activity from this sensory pool. And uh, again, just to, by way, I'm sure you've seen this several times, this motion uh, representation we think occurs in an area MT, which is in a middle stream of the, or in the middle layer of the parietal processing stream, uh, equivalent to V4. So we're, the idea is that there's a middle area that's extracting the representation, this global coherent motion, and this lives in this MT area in the monkey's brain. Okay, and then when Ken Britton and, and, and uh, Bill Newsom recorded this activity in the animals while they're making their different choices of which direction the motion is going, they found that there's a covariance, okay? And Wolfsinger referred to this, you know, covariance between what the animal sees and what the sensory activity is doing. So when the animal said the motion was moving in the preferred direction of the neuron, the neuron fired a little more. When the animal responded that it was going in the other direction, the neuron tended to be responding a little less on average. So these small fluctuations seem to uh, are correlated with the animal's sort of fluctuations in what he's reporting he's perceiving. And these were great because this allowed Mike Shanlin to come through and, and produce a, a, an informative functional model that linked this noisy fluctuation in a sensory area in MT to uh, perception. And the idea is fluctuations in MT uh, turn into fluctuations in perception, and, and this model accounted uh, for the correlations between nearby neurons, for the stimulus uh, sensitivity of these neurons. So it was a very satisfying, feed-forward, simple model that you've probably seen uh, many, many times. So this shows that it's, or suggested, a very strong causal link between fluctuations and perception. But since then, there's been a number of studies and a number of people that have suggested otherwise, that, that these two, these fluctuations between neuroactivity and behavior are really driven by what you might think of feedback signals that could be related to attention or the internal state of the animal, but, but they're not causal. Uh, perception occurred and then these signals came back to modulate the neuron, so this is the classic third variable problem that we have two things going up and down together, but I can't tell you if they're linked, right? I can't tell you if there's a causal feed-forward link or if there's something coming back. Um, this is the experiment. So I said a number of people suggested this in 2009. Uh, uh, coming uh, laboratory at NIH actually produced a, a real experiment that showed this very nicely. Uh, an animal was observing a stimulus that was stochastic, that was kind of noisy, so they could me measure the correlations between the stimulus and the behavior. And the idea was to find out during the stimulus presentation, when was this correlation the strongest? So here is a correlation uncorrelated. Notice that this correlation peaks very early and then starts to decay. So the correlation between the stimulus and the animal's perception occurred early. The animal was using activity, uh, the stimulus early on to make his judgment about, and this was a depth stimulus. Um, 
But then they measured neural activity in V2, which was supposedly encoding this stimulus, and they noticed that these correlations slowly ramped up and then uh, plateaued, and they didn't follow uh, the stimulus behavior correlations. Thus, this suggests that there's some kind of non-causal relationship between these neural behavior correlations uh, and it's not a feed-forward model. There's something, in fact, that was part of the title of the paper, that there's a non-causal relationship. If you thought that the correlations between neural activity and behavior are causal, then the, then the correlations between the stimulus and behavior and the neural activity and behavior, because the neural activity is carrying the stimulus information, these should all look the same. But instead of going down, the correlations between the neural activity and behavior stayed constant. Now, uh, they express these neural correlations in these funny numbers called choice probability. Well, I'll tell you in a few moments where these numbers come from, but what 0.5 means is that there's no correlation, and so we see these kind of positive correlations here. But again, they don't follow the same time course as the correlations between stimulus and behavior. Well, the fact that sensory neurons can be modulated by the internal state of the animal has been known for decades. Uh, uh, it, even I have measured the effects of attention, which is really just changes in internal state, on the effect of firing rate of empty neurons. And notice that this, as you ask a monkey or, a, or any other subject to vary their attention covertly, the modulations in neural activity are small and on the same time scale as these small fluctuations that are correlated with behavior that I showed you early on from Ken Britton and Bill Newsom's data. So this feedback hypothesis, you know, is reasonable, uh, but, and there's even other properties of this, this, these correlations between small fluctuations in sensory activity and behavior. Some of the other properties are that, that they, the neurons that have the best stimulus sensitivity or the neurons that are carrying the information that the animal is using to do his perception or task um, seem to have the strongest neural behavior correlations, okay, and that makes sense. Uh, and um, that, for example, motor movements of the eyes contributes to these neural correlations between fluctu neural fluctuations in behavior. And at first you might think, well, this is really supporting a feed-forward model, but, but you still can't separate. Uh, both of these could be, uh, uh, could be support also a feedback model. So you, you have a lot of difficulty, again, separating causal versus non-causal relationships between sensory activity and perceptual behavior. You could have a direct link, or you could have the third variable, the mental state, the internal state of the animal, modulating each one of these and producing the correlations when, in fact, there is no direct link. So how do you, this is a real pro hard problem to solve, how do you separate uh, this particular, you know, how do you get to the bottom of that? And there's a couple of things you can do. One of the things you can do is use, uh, in, in many of these past studies, is that people use very long stimulus presentation times that gives time for attention to reorient, uh, reorient uh, and so it mixes up uh, this causal, non-causal links feedback versus feed forward get mixed up. So what we decided to do is, again, force on very brief stimuli that the monkey's perceiving. And instead of a single stimulus, have two stimuli up there because with two stimuli, you can make some sort of interesting predictions of what should be occurring if there's a causal versus non-causal relationship between the activity and sensory pools and what the animal sees. So I'm going to spend... Uh, uh, sort of the remaining time sort of going into this particular experiment which is done by my graduate student Jackson Smith who just finishing and he's looking for a postdoc. Uh, he's a real talented electrophysiologist and a, and a postdoc who now has his own laboratory in China, uh, Chang'an Zheng. Okay, so we're going to have this two-patch motion detection task. And the goal is to see if we can distinguish between a causal relationship between neural activity, fluctuations in neural activity, and perceptual behavior. And so the way this task works is animals were simply told to respond when either or both 
patches of random dot motion moved with these very brief pulses. Again, 50 millisecond pulse. So there's the brief pulse. This pulse of motion could occur any time. And when they think they saw it, they were releasing a lever uh, within a, a reaction time window of 700 milliseconds or so. This pulse, these pulses could occur at any time during uh, with a flat hazard function from one half to eight seconds. So the animal didn't know when the signal was going to occur. In addition, uh, sometimes we put pulses in both sensory stimuli in both patches. Sometimes motion pulses were only in one patch, and the animal didn't know uh, uh, when it was either one or two. So there was uncertainty in both time and uncertainty in both space of the stimulus. So it's a very simple stimulus. And the animals love to do these kind of detection experiments. They'll knuckle down. You can see them working really hard. And when they get it right, they're real excited, and they get a reward of juice. OK. So we put these animals, we train them up. And we get some behavioral performance. And this behavioral performance is important. And I'll come back to it in a minute. But at this point, just notice that uh, when there was two pulses present, that means both motion patches had the motion, uh, they were detecting at a little over 40% of the trials. But however, if there's only one pulse, their detection performance went down. Uh, here's the failure rate, which is related to the detection rate. But their false alarm rates, which were relatively high, almost uh, a little over 35%, was the same whether there was two pulses or one pulse. Okay. Those reaction times were a little faster when there, there was two motion pulses versus a single motion pulse in just one of the patches. Okay. And this sort of makes sense, right? When there's two motion pulses occurring at the same time, there's more information. The animal should do better. They should respond faster. So again, we record, recorded from empty neurons because we think that empty neurons were the neurons that encoded this global motion stimulus. Importantly for these experiments, because we know that these neural fluctuations are only correlated with behavior when there's a match between what the neuron is encoding and what the animal's trying to do, we always match the stimulus with the properties of the neuron we're recording. We put the patches over the two receptive fields of the two MT neurons we're recording from. So we have two electrodes and MT. We have the motion direction and speed matched to each neuron. So sometimes the motion is going sort of the same direction. It could have gone a different direction. It all depended on which neuron or which, in other words, what sensory pool we're recording from. So we always match the stimulus to the neural, the properties of the neurons under observation. Okay. So this is what the data looks like. Um, motion stimulus comes on. You can tell by these rasters, which are single trials. Every little tick mark is an X potential. This is an example neuron. Uh, trials are sorted based on correct trials. The monkey detected the motion pulse. The monkey failed to detect the motion pulse in red. And they're organized based on reaction time. And right away, you see, right after the motion pulse, you see this robust neural sensory response. And you can start to notice that the response is a little bigger when, for correct trials versus failed trials, and for faster reaction times versus slower reaction times. Now, we want to come up with a measure, again, of the correlation between the fluctuations, the trial by trial fluctuations in this neural, in this neuron, and the animal's behavior. And the way we do that is through what we call detect probability, which is very similar to choice probability that I mentioned earlier from these other studies. Again, the whole idea, I'm not going to show you any math, is essentially it's called the probability because it's the probability if I give you a random sort of draw of responses from correct trials versus failed trials, what's the probability you can tell me which is which? In other words, what's, what's the probability that you can predict the animal's, animal's behavior from the neural response? So you can compute this sort of correlational measure uh, by sliding a window across the neural response. And what you see is this detect probability initially is around 0.5, which is chance. And so if I gave you a little bit of response here from a trial and here from a trial, I can't really predict the outcome of the trial. But if you look at the, uh, during the response to the motion pulse, you see this detect probability for this neuron, which is really good, uh, jumps up and peaks and then goes back down. 
So you don't need to compute a detect probability just to, to see that what this means is that the response is greater for correct trials than failed trials, and this gives me a time course of which to understand this correlation between fluctuations in this neuron's activity and the animal's behavior. Okay, so what? How is this going to answer our question between causality versus non-causality, and how can I come out with a so model of consciousness? So you just got to bear with me for another 10 minutes. First, let me say this. As I mentioned earlier, this, this correlation between small fluctuations in neural activity and behavior is related to the neural sensitivity of the neurons under study. So each, each data point is a different neuron recorded from, and what you see is, uh, say these outliers here, a pretty strong correlation in the fact that if a neuron was well correlated or strongly correlated with the animal's decision, it was carrying more information about the motion pulse. And that's what this neural sensitivity measure means. I don't have time to go into the details, but it's, it's a standard way of measuring just the signal to noise of the neuron you're recording and how that neuron's linked to behavior. So not all neurons in a sensory pool tell you the same thing about the sensory uh, stimulus, and the ones that tell you the most about the sensory stimulus are the most correlated with the animal's perception. Again, that has been seen by a number of studies uh, so we weren't surprised to see that. Now, okay, so our neural behavior correlations are, are, are good, and they're linked to neural sensitivity like everyone else has seen. So let's start looking to see how they change. And this is the important part. How do these neural behavior correlations change when we start changing how the motion pulse is occurring? Is it occurring in both, or is it occurring in one? And so here is the average detect probability uh, hovering around 0.5, a little above 0.5. It kind of ramps up right after the motion stimulus and comes down, just like the example neuron I showed you. So when there's two motion pulses present, and, and again, we're, this is one neuron and one receptive field around one motion pulse, we see this typical up and down of the correlation between the neural activity and the behavior is peak right after the motion pulse. This peak occurs at the same time as the average neural response. So this is the average neural response shown in green. But notice it's a little bit wider. And where, does this, where, where does this come from? And it seems, though there's some noise here, to take off a little bit before the stimulus occurs. Again, would you expect to find that in a feed-forward model? Because this starts to hint, well, maybe this is attention being modulated during this task. Well, I'm going to get to the punchline and say, no, it's not. OK, but we have more to show. So here, here is what happens when only one patch had the motion pulse. And the other patch had no motion pulse. If their stimulus is still there, there's, there's no motion. And the motion pulse occurred in the neuron's receptive field. Well, you may notice that this here is the uh, detect probability. The correlation between neural activity and behavior looks the same as when there was two, but seemed to get a little bigger. And then, then we can play the same game of what happens when there's one pulse, but it actually occurred in the other patch, so the neuron were listening to did not see the motion. And notice its neural behavior correlations go a little bit of above 0.5, even though there's no motion in the neuron's receptive field. Let's put this together, OK? So in black is when there's a stimulus in both sensory pools. You get a, a neural behavior correlation that peaks right when the neural response peaks. When there's only one sensory pool activated, this neural behavior correlation gets bigger, but it looks about the same. Both of these seem to be starting off way before the stimulus even occurs. And when there's a motion pulse in the essentially the other neuron's receptive field, but not in the sensory pool you're listening to, there's still a neural behavior correlation, but much weaker. So how do you explain all this? How does this separate our causal versus non-causal hypothesis, our, our two possibilities? And at first, if you first look at this data, you think, well, no, there must be some kind of a tension here. Because look, we're getting a neural behavior correlation, but there's no stimulus. 
It must be attention. But how is attention orienting so quickly? And, and what happens? How, how could this rise before the stimulus occurs? So, you know, we were a little confused. We didn't know how to really address this. So what uh, my graduate student decided to do is just, just make a simple model and see what the model predicts. And let's make a simple feed-forward model and, and see what we can reproduce. Okay, that sounds great. I mean, that's sort of what I like. I like making functional descriptions. So here is a decision model, much like the decision models that Mike Shadlin uh, talked about and many others have used for decades. And it's this notion that there's two sensory pools. The activity of the sensory pools is somehow integrated. And then the output of that integration goes through a, a decision box. And we'll model that as a simple threshold. If one of these threshold detectors is activated, the model says, oh, I see the motion. OK. So this any model has some free parameters. Some of these parameters are the threshold. Well, what's that? I don't know what to do. Uh, how do we model sensory neurons? Well, we, we sort of have a good idea of what empty neurons look like and how they behave. So we can, we can model our sensory pools. We can model some correlations between nearby neurons. We can do these kind of things fairly well. Oh, what about a temporal integration window? Where do I find one of those? Well, of course, we had a couple laying around the lab from what I told you earlier that we measured this very precisely in two different ways. So we'll just use the same temporal integrations that we measured in single neurons and in behaving monkeys with two motion pulses. OK, so we had two free parameters, sort of the signal to noise capabilities of the neurons and the, the threshold detection. And we fit the model based on one thing, the behavior when there was two motion pulses. So the monkey's behavior that I showed you, this is the percent of correct detections when there's two motion pulses. Here's the false alarm, right? Here's the fail. We try to get the model to mimic this. It did perfectly. Two free parameters. That's an easy exercise. And then we ask, well, how does the model mimic the behavior when there's only one pulse? And it did a pretty good job. Not exactly the correct uh, way, but it was the relationship is, is excellent. Uh, what about reaction times between uh, that we did not try to fit? How did the model do? Uh, the model did uh, these two scales are exactly the same. The model doesn't have a motor delay. It's not releasing a lever. So these numbers are different. But the, it captured the increase in reaction time with one pulse versus two. But it didn't really capture as well as we'd like the distribution of reaction times. But uh, qualitatively, it captured the reaction times very well. OK, so here is a model with two free parameters, nailed the behavior. What about the neural behavior correlations? Well, the same thing happened in the neural behavior correlations. If we took our model MT neurons and asked how it's correlated with the model's behavior, and we look at the dynamics, we see it has almost identical dynamics. We have, uh, when there's one pool activated with only one motion uh, pulse, its neural behavior correlations are stronger than when there's uh, two motion pulses there, as we saw in the real data here. So again, this is the detect probability, the correlation between the neural activity and behavior. We see that this correlation increases or starts ramping up before the motion pulse. And we see that this correlation then goes up even when there's no motion or stimulus in that sensory pool. And this is a completely feed-forward model. How does that work? And this is, the great, uh, this is the great thing about these kind of models is you can use the models to understand the neurophysiology, understand the neural observations. That you can go to the model and say, listen, it makes really completely sense, good sense that when there's only one sensory pool activated, that the neural behavior correlation should be greater than when there's two. Because when there's only one pool, then that means there's fewer neurons contributing to the behavioral outcome. When we act, put a sensory stimulus in both pools, there's more neurons contributing to the behavioral response. Therefore, these correlations are, are reduced. Likewise, for, if there's no sensory stimulus in, in the pool, in other words, the sensory stimulus is occurring here but not down here, we still get neural behavior correlations because of the noise, the random noise in the system. Because remember, these stimuli are at threshold. Sometimes a monkey sees it, sometimes they don't. So there's a lot of noise, but just by random chance, the other pool contributes to the behavioral decision. And also, this early ramp up in the 
and the MT data in the correlation between neural activity and behavior is completely accounted for by these temporal integration windows. And of course, the temporal integration windows, as I said, came from other experiments, both cellular and behavior, so it all makes sense. Okay, but here's the problem. You know, this is sort of unsatisfying model because we know there's an internal state. We assume primates, monkeys, have some form of a neural correlative consciousness. Uh, what happened to that? Did I just, did that disappear? Um, as this really simple feed forward model predicts? Okay, so let's look for that. And as Wolf Singer mentioned, and I have only about five more minutes, but there's only a few more slides to go, is that there are oscillations in the neural signals that may be indicative of some of these processes that are associated with this, quote, this neural correlates of, of consciousness. Okay, and let's look at what these, these signals are. So we, did, we recorded all these signals with our two electrodes, um, and what you can do is you can Fourier transform this and ex extract the frequency components shown here, and so this is frequency on uh, the y-axis, the x-axis is time. Here's our motion pulse occurring. Here is the detect probability. So what I'm going to show is detect probability. But first focus on this top plot. Because this is important. This is the detect probability of the spiking neurons. Just what I've already shown you. It kind of goes up. It's correlated with behavior. And then it goes down. Okay, And it goes up a little. starts going up before the motion pulse turns on. Okay, so this is the correlation between the spiking activity, the neural fluctuations in spiking activity, and the animal's uh, perception. Now look at all these other frequency, these lower frequency components, and here we're plotting again the same detect probability, the same correlation between uh, the uh, different frequency bands and behavior. What is shown here early on is what's commonly known as the high gamma band right here. This seems, you see this detect probability increases. It looks a lot like the spiking correlation with behavior. But now look at down here kind of lower uh, into what we might call the beta band or the low beta band depending on who you talk to. These correlations do something else. They're around 0.5, which means no correlations, but then they start going negative. So there's a negative correlation that occurs a little bit later at these low frequencies that looks a lot different than the positive correlations in the neural activity and the positive correlations in the gamma band. Let's collapse this down to some time scales so we can look at the dynamics and compare it. So let's compare dynamics again against our three sort of sensory conditions here in the spike data. I've shown you this. We've talked about it. We can model it. We, we don't like the model, but at least the model works. And now look at these two bands. And now the gamma band, of course, looks a lot like the spiking data in its correlation with behavior. This gamma frequencies are positively correlated with uh, behavior and they're maximally correlated with behavior right about the same time as the spike activity is correlated with behavior. When there's a stimulus, the red and the black, in the receptive field of the neuron we're recording from. So the, the stimulus pool, if it has the motion pulse, it has this positive correlation in the gamma band with behavior just like the spike data. And when it doesn't have the motion pulse, it has maybe kind of a weak little bump, just like sort of the spike data. Okay. Now the beta band is the interesting part. Now this has been shown before by Lou and Newsom, uh, is really the only example before, and something different is happening here. There's a negative correlation, and it seems to be almost equally strong depending whether there was motion in there in the receptive field or motion in the other receptive field. It didn't really matter. There seems to be sort of this negativity that goes down, maybe peaks around here, and then starts going back up. The problem is we had to cut off the data right here because the animal starts responding reaction time, so we start losing trials. So about here is where the beta band, you might think, it peaks. Now what do we know about beta band frequencies in neural activity. What we know is that uh, from work like my colleague and friend Julio Martinez and Paul Kayat, his postdoc, that when an animal or monkey orients his attention, the power in these beta band drops. And other studies have shown that these beta band fluctuations are due to sort of intracortical 
communications or, or other things. So if we think this is a sort of a, this could be a measure of attentional orientation. So here's our internal state changing. Here is our sensory stimulus being linked to the behavior and then following about 100 milliseconds later is, is presumably this attentional change, okay? Or the peak attentional change. This is when attention, if we believe this correlation between the beta band and the orienting of attention, this is the peak correlation between this beta band activity or the peak correlation between the attention and the animal's ability to perform the task. So this is my last data slide. The, the buzzer just went off. Um, and now my problem with this, and, and I'm going to su I'm suggesting here that somewhere between this correlation, peak correlation between sensory, which is gamma or spikes, and sort of beta, that this is where this quote, the animal felt the motion pulse, right? And this is the title of our session, Firing and Feelings. Okay, so this is where this feeling occurred, a neural correlates of consciousness. We identified the time window of when this is occurring. The dynamics suggest this. I, I'm not going to claim that very strongly because, you know, the problem, with, again, with these, these low-frequency signals is interpreting what they really mean and where they come from. We don't fully know, okay? The gamma, I'm comfortable saying that this sure does look a lot like uh, a, a stimulus, like the, uh, the spiking of the neurons, but these beta bands, well, you know, uh, we have to be careful. But it's suggestive, okay? And this, so, so I told you I would leave you or end this talk on some kind of cor correlate of, of consciousness, and there you have it. And that's all you're going to get from me. So in summary, okay, so I talked about this idea of linking neural fluctuations in a sensory area with a perceptual behavior, and we can do that, and then we can create models to try to understand how this links occurs and maybe eliminate different hypotheses about forward and feedback, causality, non-causality, and this works pretty well, and a, a causal model does work, but you know, nowhere can I get up here and claim causality, right? I, I just can't do that, because we are, again, only measuring correlations. And on that last note, uh, again, uh, Chang and Zhang, Jackson Smith are the two people who did this most of this experiments, Nick Mass, uh, my first PhD student, did some of the early work measuring temporal integrations, and these are past and current members of the lab. I'll take any questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, please. Uh